Hello, and welcome to AFCAM's webinar on Colour Compensation in Flow Cytometry. Today's guest speakers are Graham Pockley and Ian Dimmick. Graham's research areas are focused on immunoregulatory mechanisms in health and disease, and he is currently the Associate Director of the John Van Geest Cancer Research Centre at Nottingham Trent University. He has used and been a supporter of flow cytometry throughout his career. Ian began his career in a clinical setting and has worked in various research posts using flow cytometry as a diagnostic and research tool, primarily for HIV, leukemia, lymphoma, and a broad range of immunological testing. Ian currently manages the flow cytometry core facility at Newcastle University. Joining Ian and Graham today will be Ken, supplier manager based at AFCAM's Boston office. Before we start, just a quick reminder that any questions you have during the webinar can be submitted via the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Also, when you log off from the webinar, you will be directed to a web page where a copy of the presentation slides can be downloaded. I will now hand over to Graham, who will start this webinar. Thank you, Lucy, and welcome, welcome everybody to today's webinar on colour compensation. As Lucy said, I've spent quite a a large amount of my research career working in flow cytometry and I think if there's one aspect of flow cytometry that still causes concerns it uh, surrounds colour compensation and an understanding of how one should design appropriate experiments and with the increasing number of lasers and detectors in the next generation instruments the problems are only going to get uh, more difficult to resolve. So before I turn over the main part of the uh, webinar over to Ian, I'll probably just go through the key elements of the, um, of the webinar that we're going to go through, through today. Okay. So really what we want to cover today is why do multicolor experiments? I think maybe we, we sort of all have our own views on that, but it's important to consider why we do them and is it necessary and to what extent is the information uh, going to provide uh, insight into our particular experimental questions. There's a large range of fluorochromes available these days, so which of those should I use in, in these experiments? What is spectral overlap and why do we need compensation? A key element is what is the procedure for compensation. And really, it's always good to, to see problems uh, in real life. And so Ian's going to take us through some uh, examples of spillover events and how you can calculate the spillover. And as with any experimental procedure, it's crucial to, to have the correct controls in the experiment. And so he's going to go through those elements of experimental design as well. So without further ado, I'd just like to hand over to Ian and just once again remind you that if you do have any questions, please don't necessarily wait till the end. If you can just get those to us as we go through, then we can, we can start to try and answer those as we go through the webinar. Ian. Okay, thanks very much, Graham. Um, so the first question, why, why do multicolor experiments? Um, it, it's pivotal to all of our research that we, we, we actually um, accumulate as much data as possible um, from experiments. And um, then the next slide will, will effectively show you that if we use, for example, six antisera with, with, uh, within uh, a single tube, um, then you will see that you will get um, maximum of 18 phenotypes out of this. Um, so you, you, are, you are limited to the actual phenotypes depicted by the, the antisera per tube. If, however, you then put all six antisera, depicted here by three antisera per tube, into a single tube, then you can see these dark areas are the phenotypes that you would never ever see by keeping the antisera separate within two tubes. So if you, um, if you then um, take on board that um, all you need to do is have uh, perhaps a little bit more in the way of a, a, a more expensive instrument and put a little bit more thought into the actual experiment setup and protocol itself, then you can actually um, increase the data that you're getting out of your experiment uh, considerably so 
Now, these are 36 discrete phenotypes as opposed to the 18 phenotypes, and that's a twofold increase. However, what is not shown here are the non discrete phenotypes. So, the actual um, uh, the, the doubling effect can be enhanced when you start looking at the, uh, the, the very subtle changes in the phenotypes that you can see between the discrete phenotypes. So, it's quite a, an exponential rise in, uh, in, in data that you're going to get. Uh, this then begs the question, which fluorochrome do I use? Well, um, it, this is probably a, a, a very, very good pivotal question, um, and this is where um, you shouldn't just lodge, uh, uh, log into a catalog and on, into a, on a website and just choose whichever ones fit into the uh, lasers that you have. Um, you need to consider a considerable uh, amount of variables that you're going to come across when you actually create the experiment. Um, fluorochromes all basically work on the same principle in that um, we, we, we excite the fluorochrome by, um, by a, a laser, and this laser should be roughly in the area of the maximum um, extinction coefficient of the fluorochrome. And once the um, electron goes into the higher orbital, which is quite unstable, um, it will then go back to the stable orbital. Now, Within this process, there's a certain amount of heat dissipated, and this is consequential in that the excitation wavelength and the emission wavelength of the photon falling back down to the more stable uh, configuration will always be a longer wavelength than the excitation. Um, and uh, this is the, the, the basic state of play for, for all fluorochromes, that you will excite at a lower wavelength and you will emit at a higher wavelength. And this very, very useful tool um, is the Spectrum Viewer. And the, the, the advantage of this tool is that it will give you some degree of, of capacity of looking at which fluorochromes will fit onto your particular instrument. However, please remember this is very graphical. And very often, um, you can be misled by this tool sometimes. Um, so be very, very careful when using this tool. Don't exclude fluorochromes um, on the basis of this tool, but it is a very, very useful tool in its basic form. The fluorochrome itself um, is excited in terms of the extinction coefficient, as I've already discussed, and it's excited at a specific absorbed maximum wavelength. This is the optimum. <laughs> With few examples, the excitation of the fluorochrome is never at the absorbance maxima. It's far away from that. And then the emission is depicted by the quantum fluorescence. The degree of emission is depicted by the quantum fluorescence of that particular fluorochrome. And the value that we are given for the quantum fluorescence is a value that's measured over the entire spectral emission value. And you never measure the entire spectral emission of a fluorochrome, apart from occasionally when you're using a very broad long-pass filter but that is uh, on your instrument. But, but that, again, um, is not always the norm. So the, the theoretical value that you get um, that de should depict the fluorochrome of extinction coefficient multiplied by the quantum fluorescence is virtually never reached, but it will give you the extinction coefficient and the quantum fluorescence, and this value that usually for the quantum fluorescence goes between 0.5 um, to less than 1, uh, just below less than 1, is very much a theoretical value, but again, it's very much like the spectral viewer. It will actually give you an indication of um, what you are dealing with, but it will not be a finite value that will give you an absolute value. Um, these are some very useful values. These stain indexes are basically um, the function of um, the fluorochrome that has been placed onto a cell. It is then run on a flow cytometer, and you look at the negative content of that staining as opposed to the positive content of the staining. And this stain index is a very, very good value in terms of the brightness of that fluorochrome. The brightness of the fluorochrome with respect to the autofluorescence of the cells that you're dealing with. And it should be remembered that these values here, 
all these values down here rely on the quantum fluorescence, the extinction coefficient, the autofluorescence of the cells that you're dealing with, the power of the lasers, and the filter setup of your instrument. So these values should not be interpreted as a finite value that you can achieve on your particular <coughs> instrument. It's instrument dependent, it's cell dependent, and it's laser power dependent also. Ian, to, to just a quick question whilst we're going through. So uh, certainly the stain index value is, is very, the value is very much dependent on the instrument, but would you expect the order of, of the fluorochromes to be the same irrespective? Yes, the order should be very similar to what you see in front of you, yes. And this gets us to the statement that we've all heard people say before is that you reserve the brightest fluorochrome, in brightness in inverted commas, for the antigens that have the lowest cellular concentration and also reserve the less bright fluorochromes for the antigens that contain the highest cellular concentration of your antigen. Um, this is just a, a common sense approach. And the stain index, you can see here, is depicted by the signal from the cell, which is depicted by this positive peak, but it's also depicted by the width of the autofluorescence. So the stain index is this distance from the negative to the positive um, divided by the width or standard deviation that can be achieved by the negative part of the cell. And the standard deviation is very important because, as you can see, if we take this narrow peak, the distance from the positive to this narrow peak is far greater than if you have a highly autofluorescent cell, such as mesenchymal stem cells, such as embryonic stem cells, as opposed to, say, lymphocytes. So the stain index also will, will vary from cell type to cell type, as well as from instrument to instrument. 